where there are conflicts between the state's evidence and the defense evidence, that can give rise to a reasonable doubt. Or where the state's evidence simply fails to answer an important question, that can give rise to a reasonable doubt. And so what is the state's obligation in one of those situations? Because any one of those situations can lead to a not guilty verdict, requires a not guilty verdict. What is the state's obligation in those circumstances? The state's obligation has to do with the presumption of innocence. The defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. This means you must presume or believe the defendant is innocent. And this presumption stays with the defendant as to each material element in the indictment through each stage of the trial, unless it has been overcome by the evidence to the exclusion of and beyond a reasonable doubt. That's their burden. Any time one of those types of doubts, one of those reasonable doubts, based on non-speculative, non-imaginary doubt, based on evidence, a lack of evidence or conflict in evidence comes up, it is their affirmative, proactive obligation to exclude it. Again, not merely introduce evidence inconsistent with it. Just to kind of put that law in context, we can briefly refer back to the example that Mr. Fuchs and I both used in jury selection with your friend's car, right? Your friend calls you and says, it's coming over. You look out the window, you see his car parked outside. He knocks on the door. The question is, has the state proven beyond and to the exclusion of other reasonable doubt that your friend is the one who drove the car? Might be a reasonable assumption that he did drive the car, but in the absence of evidence establishing that he drove the car, you have a lack of evidence of reasonable doubt. If there's a conflict in the evidence, if a neighbor says, hey, I saw your friend get out of the car there, but the friend says, I didn't drive, my wife drove me, what are you talking about? Though those pieces of evidence may be inconsistent, though you might find the neighbor more credible than your friend, nothing about one person saying this happened excludes the possibility that what the other person said is true. That's a conflict in the evidence, which the state must exclude. And if your friend take the stand and tell you, I promise you, I did not drive over here. My wife's sitting in the car right now, you just can't see her because the windows are tinted. Once that evidence is out, the doubt is not speculative. The doubt is not imaginary. And again, the state has the proactive, affirmative obligation to exclude that doubt because it's reasonable. So the question that you have to answer in this case is not, did the defendant commit the murder? The question is, does the state's evidence exclude and eliminate every reasonable doubt about whether the defendant committed the offense? The first thing I want to talk about in terms of the evidence, lack of the evidence, conflict in the evidence, is the lack of evidence. The reason that I want to talk about that is because the state had the ability in this case to answer important questions and simply failed to do that. Simply didn't think it was worthwhile to engage in the effort to answer those important questions. And no more, nowhere is that more clear than at Jack McClain Park. Within days of the murder, they find a burned out trash can containing what apparently is a bloody t-shirt containing Six gloves. They said gloves. Containing a bottle of bleach, containing shop towels. In the stall, you find one of those shop towels has been flushed. You see a paper towel on the side of the side of the stall, which has apparent blood stains on it. And you find cleanup clothes, new clothes, outside. What is the evidence that is lacking here? First, let's talk about the shirt. Joellen Brown told you that the best place to get touch DNA on a shirt is from the collar and from the armpits. You can run a swab across it, and if a person has worn it any time recently, you're likely to get a good DNA sample. Now, there was talk about what effect the elements might have had on it, what effect the, the fire might have had on it, but you don't know. You don't know what effect those things would have on it unless you test it. This is a capital murder case. 
that they're trying to get you to convict someone and recommend death. And they can't be bothered to send a bloody t-shirt located two-tenths of a mile from the victim's house and burned up trash can in for testing to FDLE? What about the gloves? The gloves were sent off. The gloves were tested only for blood, though, not for touch DNA. And the blood that was on the gloves, as Joel Brown testified, did exclude Mr. Segura. But they never ran swabs over the outside of the gloves searching for touch DNA. They made no effort to do that. TPD didn't request that FDLE do that. They never swabbed the bleach bottle for touch DNA. They never tested the paper towel for blood or touch DNA. They never went inside the bathroom and tested the, the area where the bloody towels were found for touch DNA. And then we have the UPC codes. Investigator Lewis told you himself, they had the ability to go to the point of purchase. We know what that is because it says it right on the tags from Walmart. Those tags are in evidence. You can look at them if you want to. With that UPC code, they could go to Walmart, loss prevention, have them scan the UPC code, and pull up the video of the purchase. They could have gotten a HD video of one of the people who committed the offense buying their new clothes. Didn't bother to do it. Now, Investigator Lewis gave an explanation as to why not. He said they presumed the bathroom had been cleaned, though never called anybody from the city, never made any inquiry at all as to whether the bathrooms had been cleaned. I would submit, folks, that that testimony that he presumed or believed that the bathroom had been cleaned is not credible at all. If they didn't believe the bathroom was related to this murder, why would they go through the effort of going out there, taking all the pictures, collecting it all? Why would they go through the effort of admitting it all into evidence in this murder trial? Why would Mr. Fuchs pick up the bloody t-shirt and parade it back and forth in front of you in dramatic fashion? This has to, weren't you waiting? Weren't you waiting for him to come and tie that to the defendant after he did that? Of course, it never happened. Remember as you look at those failures, failures to conduct reasonable investigative steps, failure to invest reasonable and investigative effort, where we are and what we're doing. This is a capital murder trial. And they want to tell you they left, every, they, they left no stone unturned. Is that leaving no stone unturned? Could they not? have introduced evidence in one direction or the other by testing the evidence that they obtained, <coughs> but they didn't bother to do that. Let's talk about the lack of evidence that has to do with the DNA and the blood and all the rest of the physical evidence. Mr. Hughes keeps saying there's no blood, there's no, or rather, there's no DNA. That's not the testimony at all. There is DNA. There's just not DNA from him. There's DNA under the victim's fingernails. He lost an acrylic nail. There's DNA on the phone in the bedroom. There's DNA on the shelf. It's just that it's not Henry's DNA. And so while there is some accuracy to what he's saying, Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. There's some truth to that. It's true that masking can occur. Part of the reason you don't see any of Henry's DNA anywhere in the house is, as Mr. Fuchs suggested, there's blood everywhere. And so if he had been sitting on the love seat, like he said, and there's now blood all over the love seat, you're not going to get his DNA. But part of the reason also is because they're only testing murdery areas. They're not going into her bedroom and swapping the pillow or the sheets. They didn't do that. They didn't test that. If they had done that, they likely would have found touch DNA for Mr. Segura. But of course, again, they couldn't be bothered to do that. You also heard testimony about the, the bracelet that was found at a point in the hallway where she had obviously been engaged in a struggle. Blood spatter on the, both sides of the wall right there. The lamp has been knocked over. The bracelet obviously fell off during the course of that struggle, and yet, no testing performed on that either. There were over 200 samples 
DNA sample swaps collected in the space and sent it to FDLE. Henry is not included in any of them. That's an important lack of evidence, especially when viewed in, in the light of the fact that other people were identified from the DNA. There's plenty of DNA, just not this. Another important point to remember is the lack of blood. But if Mr. Knox told you the people who committed this offense would be covered in blood, blood spatter everywhere. You saw pictures of all Henry's cars. They're in evidence. You can look at them. They're all messy. There ain't no blood from anybody in there. There's no victim blood in any of his vehicles. How is that possible? They've not been cleaned, and yet there's no blood. That's another important piece of evidence. Or rather, more accurately stated in this context, an important lack of evidence. Another thing that they failed to do here was take scrapings from underneath the nails of the twins <coughs> of Dante. You heard that they did that with Brandy, but they didn't do that with the twins. Part of the reason for that was there was no injuries, no apparent injuries on the twins of Dante. But does that mean that they're not going to flail and struggle in the course of being drowned? That doesn't make sense. I mean, why, why not? Why not test? Why not see? Why not take scrapings? Maybe you get more DNA. Maybe it matches the DNA under Brandy's fingernails. If it's your theory that it's Henry, maybe it matches him. You have to take those steps when you have the sole and exclusive burden of proof. That is how you exclude reasonable doubt. And then we have the fact that there are hair and latents that were tested or not tested in this case. Some of the hairs found in the scene were not suitable for testing, but some of them were. And yet, the decision was made not to test them. Again, why? What possible reason could justify not testing hairs that are suitable for testing? And the latent prints that we have. There was only one latent print of value that was foreign to Brandy and the kids. Guess who was excluded? Hen. What hen? Now, do we know that that latent print is from the murder? Murdered? No. Maybe it's from a friend that came over. Maybe it's from Jeremy Smith, whose DNA was on the cigarette in Brandy's bedroom and was a friend of hers. We don't know that, though. All we know is that there's a lack of evidence, physical evidence, connecting Henry to the scene. And then we have the shoe impressions, right? Before we get into that, let me remind you what everyone testified to about that. First, the TPD officer or forensic tech testified she found five probable shoe impressions. Mr. Knox testified he identified five probable shoe impressions in the foyer area right around Brandy. Although it is possible, as Mr. Fuchs pointed out in cross-examination, that some of those might have been impressions from other things, both forensic people agreed they were probable shoe impressions. And yet, TPD made no effort to exclude the officers as the contributors of those impressions. No efforts whatsoever. What Mr. Knox told you is that the right thing to do in those situations is to take the shoes or pictures of the shoes from the officers, swab those shoes, make sure, if that's your suggestion, your suggestion is that the cops stepped in the blood and the cops made the impressions, exclude that doubt. That's your burden. When you have the sole and exclusive burden of proof and you have the sole and exclusive ability to exclude that question, exclude that doubt, that's what you have to do. That is your burden. The other thing to remember about that is <coughs> they had the ability to test Henry's shoes, boots, anything else, that, uh, any other footwear they could find against the impressions found at the scene. Not for identification necessarily, but for elimination or class comparison. That's what Mr. Knox told you. They executed a search warrant at Henry's house. They took in everything they deemed to be of evidentiary value. Did they ever test his shoes against any of those shoe impressions? No. No, no, no. Yeah, no that's in evidence. Overruled. Right, exactly. None of that's in evidence. That's my point. Right. Don't take the court's ruling and make arguments in front of Yes, sir. Thank you. We're talking about reasonable doubts based on lack of evidence. 
My point here is they had the ability to test Mr. Segura's shoes against the shoes that were taken from the, or against the shoe impressions that were from the scene and simply failed to do so. Another thing that bears mentioning is the lack of injuries to Mr. Segura. Whether you consider that evidence or a lack of the evidence, I guess it could be viewed either way, but we'll talk about it here. The victim fought for her life. We saw all the impressions in the Fourier area. We saw the handprint on the wall where she had gotten back up. We know that she was being shot. We know that she was being beaten with multiple objects. She fought. She had her kids in the house and she fought. Her fingers are broken. Her acrylic nails are pulled off. She scratched. She had DNA under her fingernails. Ladies know how hard it is to pull an acrylic nail off. That's not a defensive wound. That is an aggressive movement, an aggressive action against the assailants. And that's how victims often speak to us from beyond the grave. They know that. Even if they're not stopping to think, gee, what am I going to do to prove this? Who, who, who hurt me? That's something that's kind of subconsciously there, that they do. We know that she fought here. And yet, no scratches at all consistent with that type of fight on Mr. Segura. He has a tiny little scratch that you can barely see, which, like he said, is consistent with reaching into bushes to get an arrow. Another tiny little scratch that you can barely see, consistent with reaching into the bushes to get arrows. Another thing that is worth considering. I don't know if you noticed this when Mr. Fuchs held the shirt up in front of you or not. But there's damage to this t-shirt in the area of the blood. On one of the sleeves, there's a puncture as if, I don't know, an acrylic nail went through it. And that is the area from which the blood emanates. If it is true, as TPD apparently initially believed, that the Jack McClane scene is connected to these murders, you would expect to see injuries on the assailant or assailants consistent with bleeding, stabbing. You don't see anything like that on him. That's another piece of important evidence or another important lack of evidence in this case. I also want to briefly mention the failure to take reasonable investigative steps to eliminate other potential suspects. I'll talk more about Paramore and Griffin and Kalo and Santos later during the discussion of the evidence. But what we know is Paramore and Griffin were friends, they were associated with each other, they were involved in the drug game together, and Paramore admitted to his cousin that they were involved in the commission of the offense. He then admitted it again on a recorded line that Detective Basio was listening to. And yet, they made no efforts to talk to Mr. Paramore's alibi witnesses. None. They didn't send in the DNA until 2016 when I shamed them at a deposition, as the testimony indicated. And even then, as Mr. Bundy said yesterday, it was only tested against one of the 200 exhibits. What about Halo and Santos? We know from the letters that the state admitted Exhibit 98, Santos is in federal custody. We know from the letters that he claims to be a member of the Vice Lords, a criminal organization in the United States. We know that he's in close communication with Kayla during that time. He mentions that in his letters as well. And yet, law enforcement makes no efforts to get Santos calls to find out who else he's talking to. And when Cece tells them about it, they tell her Santos doesn't exist. Again, a lack of investigative effort. 
reasonable. This isn't Monday morning quarterbacking. These are things that you should do when you're going to prosecute somebody in a capital murder case. In the context of considering that, uh, that lack of evidence, I want you to remember as you deliberate what CC said, who CC was afraid of, who Artron was afraid of. CC's Brandy's best friend at the time. They're together all the time. And she knows what Brandy's doing. Yet, is she scared to testify at this trial because of Henry? Or anybody connected to Henry? No. She's scared of Santos. That's what she told you. That's why the state had to get a material witness warrant for her. Because she's scared of Santos. Why is that? Yet law enforcement dismissed it. Didn't get his phone calls. Didn't take reasonable investigative steps. We also have the spade found at the scene. Now, people can argue whether it's a calling card or it's not a calling card. The only evidence in the record is that it is a calling card. Mr. Fuchs can dispute that with argument, but his argument is speculation, not evidence. The only evidence introduced on that point came from the defense cartel expert, who has personal experience as well as scholarly experience researching those issues. But if you don't think so, if you think it's irrelevant, if you think people just have garden tools laying in the middle of their living room that are not used in the commission of the offense, then what should you probably do to exclude the possibility that it is a calling card? Mr. Knox told you there was soil on the spade. If you think it's Brandy's, test the soil and test the soil in her yard. If you think it's Henry's, test the soil and test the soil in his yard. If you want to exclude the possibility that it's the cartel, test the soil and test the soil in Brownsville, Texas. But now. I also want to talk about the interaction between Tyra Wilcoxon's testimony and Calvin Moore's testimony. First, with respect to Tyra Wilcoxon, it is worth mentioning, as the state relies on her testimony in closing, that they have Henry's phone records. Remember that? They have Henry's phone records, all his phone records. If he went to her house that week, don't you think they would have put on evidence showing that he went to her house that week? If he called her to talk about the facts of the case the Monday afterwards, as she claimed, don't you think they would have put that evidence in front of you? Why isn't it in front of you? Because it didn't happen. That's why. You can see that clearly and see that they're just throwing stuff at the wall when you compare her testimony to Mr. No uh, Mr. Moore's testimony. If it is true, as they suggest initially, that Henry already has a gun, why would he even be at Tyra's house asking for a gun? And if he needs a gun, why would he already have a gun? The two things don't make a whole lot of sense together. Mr. Fuchs suggested in his closing, maybe it's because he doesn't want to use his own gun. Okay, that'd be fine. Well, why would his gun then be gone? Like, if you're going to use some street gun, don't you keep your gun so you can be like, look, I got a gun. Here it is. Test it. It's not the case because his gun is gone. Remember what Mr. Moore said, by the way. Mr. Moore said when he saw Henry with the gun, he didn't remember exactly what it, when it was. It could have been back in July. And it was back in July. Look, I'm not afraid of Henry's bad character traits. I showed you the good and I showed you the bad. I had him tell you truthfully he went to Mississippi or wherever it was and got in a shootout. I'm not afraid of that. He's got bad traits. He's also got good traits. He ain't the devil incarnate, though. He's a guy. He's a guy who does street stuff. He's a guy who cheats. But their evidence fails to exclude the reasonable possibility, based on the testimony, that he got rid of, got rid of that guy in July. The next category of stuff I want to talk about is the evidence itself. In the context of the evidence, the first thing I want to talk about is the time of death. Here, the state's only real piece of evidence that they're relying on to suggest time of death is the fact that her phone runs out of juice at some point. That's it. Now look, if you have testimony from her, friends and family, she's on the phone all the time, she keeps her phone with her, she would usually charge it, and that's the only evidence you have? Okay, that'd be reasonable. But that's not the only evidence we have. We have other evidence 
which indicates the time of death. So let's talk first about what Monica Peters said. She took the stand here and claimed that she told law enforcement, what she meant to tell law enforcement was that she had only attempted to talk to Brandy at 10 o'clock. But Officer Jernigan said she knew she was emotional and attempted to clarify several times before she wrote it down on her sworn paper, on her sworn report, what time did you talk to her? What time did you talk to her? And she told Officer Jernigan, 10 o'clock. Okay? If you want to exclude that reasonable doubt, if you think that Monica Peters is mistaken, what should you probably do? You got all the cell phone records in the case, what should you probably get? Landline records. We're here on a capital murder case. There's another active line in the house, and we don't have any landline records. Is that an unreasonable request? When you have witness testimony saying, she talked to me at 10 o'clock, and you have another line, isn't that a reasonable step to take? Now, Monica Peter said for the first time here in court that she talked to her on the cell phone. She doesn't remember exactly what time she talked to her, how she can remember exactly what time or exactly what line she talked to her on. The other thing, and this is the most important thing relative to the time of death to take into account, and the reason, of course, Mr. Hughes didn't mention it in his close, is the testimony of Marquise Davis paired with Nadine Flanagan. Remember when he got an opening statement and told you, look, they had their last meal between 4 and 5 p.m. The food was digesting for about three hours because they had never talked to Marquise Davis in a capital murder case. And then it's his fault. All of a sudden, it's his fault. Well, she's your friend. Why didn't you come forward? Like, the obligation is on him? Like, I know that might be hard to understand. If you don't live in a neighborhood where people don't want to interact with law enforcement, even in circumstances like that, I get that's hard to understand. But that is the reality. That's what he told you the reality is. Mr. Fuchs has to prove, has to exclude the possibility that what Mr. Davis is saying is true. Because... If it is true, if the kids and Brandy eat at 7 o'clock, that means the earliest, the earliest, they could die is about 10.30, because that's when they finish eating. And guess where Henry is at 10.30? It doesn't matter if he's at the Publix or the gas station. He's down in Woodville by his house. Nobody disputed that. Investigator Corbett and Mr. Sawicki agreed on that. At 9.30 p.m., Mr. Segura is home never leaves Woodville again that night. His phone is active. And we know it's him who's active on the phone for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's on the girlfriend phone. Number two, we have the text messages. You can look at them. They're all in evidence. He's talking to Natasha Hawthorne about setting up his next hookup. He's home from 9.30 on. Marquise Davis feeds the kids dinner at 7. The medical examiner says the food has to digest for three hours. That means they died when Henry is home. He also, I would submit, misstated what Artron, uh, Artron's testimony was. He didn't say that they ate at 5.45. He said he was in his room rapping when they ate dinner, if they ate dinner. He didn't know anything about that. What he saw when he came home between 4 and 5 was Burger King wrappers out in the, yard, in, in the yard that he had to clean up. They had already eaten by the time he gets home. So you have the meal, 4, 4.30, something like that, and then you have another meal. The state has introduced no evidence. Forget about excluding. The state has introduced no evidence at all that is inconsistent with Marquis Davis. And this is, this, like, the, the whole case could boil down to this simple point. They have failed to exclude the possibility that she is alive at 10.30. In fact, the evidence conclusively, conclusively proves she is alive at 10.30 when Henry is home. There's no dispute about that. Henry is home at 10.30. He's down in Woodville. Then you have the testimony of Dehan Scott. She was the last defense witness to testify. She says... She sees a white SUV in Brandy's driveway at 10.50, 11 o'clock. Oh, before I move on to her, I don't want to forget the other part of Marquis Davis' testimony, which is when he got home from his dad's house at 8.30, he saw an SUV, a dark-colored SUV, in her driveway. What does that mean? That's consistent with what Henry said. 
He had to leave because she had company coming over. He did leave between 8 and 8.30. If she was dead at that point, that person would have called the police. If she died shortly after that, that person would be the murderer. But he wasn't. He was just company. And somebody else came at 10.50. That's what the Hannah Scott tells us. Now, in rebuttal, Mr. Fuchs wanted to put on a picture of the defendant's wife's SUV. An expedition. What the Hannah Scott says is that it was a white suburban, whatever, similar types of vehicles. What exactly is he suggesting there, though? Like, stop to think about that for a second. What is he suggesting? Because we know it's not the defendant. We know the defendant's not there at 10.50 p.m. He's home texting one of his girlfriends. So what's he suggesting? That the defendant's wife is also the devil? That his mother is also the devil? Accusing more people of committing an unspeakable act with no evidence to support it whatsoever? Like, at some point, if the square peg is not fitting in the round hole, you have to down to the fact it's because it's square and it's round. It doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense because they don't go together. You also have the testimony of Darius Mount. Darius Mount says the dog starts going crazy late that evening. That's consistent with what the Hannah Scott said about the motion-activated motion lights coming out. That's consistent with what the Hannah Scott said about her dog barking at Brandy's house, not at the back fence line, not at squirrels, not at deers, at Brandy's house. And the Hannah Scott also told you that the dog only does that when there's commotion in people. I mean, what does that suggest? It doesn't prove anything. But it's certainly good circumstantial evidence. And when you pair that with the fact that you got an SUV at her house at that time, and the fact that you have Brandy alive at least until 10.30, it all starts to become a lot more clear. The other thing that it's worth mentioning with respect to Brandy's phone being dead, and to what extent that is a piece of evidence, remember what we found here. We found the phone ripped out of the wall. We found a scuff mark on the wall. If Brandy is dead, when her phone still has juice in the seven o'clock hour, why is she running to the landline? Why would she not just call somebody or attempt to call somebody on her cell phone? Why would she run to the back of the house and go to the landline? If she's running to the landline, it's probably because she knows she was busy and didn't have a, uh, an opportunity to charge her phone. And look, anybody that has kids knows how that goes. Like, Three-year-olds are on the phone all day long watching Incredible Hulk surprise egg videos and monster truck videos, that's what they do. And we know that Brandy was active on her phone all throughout the day. She had an hour-long call with her mom shortly before her phone ran out of juice and went dead. Another important thing to consider about when her phone goes dead will be talked about when we go through the cell phone records because her cell phone did not go inactive and off the network at 713. That was just the last call on the network. There were data and text messages being received when her phone was still on the network until 7.49 p.m. When Mr. Segura was still actively texting and engaging in data sessions himself at her house. Another thing that we have to talk about when we're considering the evidence the state has presented is motive here. Did you notice that the state completely ignored the fact that all of the negative consequences which they were claiming Henry was going to face were all in place already from Tamika. She, look, he's been through this before. But he knows how to deal with it. She got a $20,000 judgment against him. She had him put in jail. She got his driver's license suspended. And what did he do about that? Did he kill her? No. He complied a little bit, paid a little bit. He also worked all over the country so that they couldn't garnish his wages. He made efforts to be involved in his daughter's life and did get involved in his daughter's life. He learned that if he made partial payments, they wouldn't do any of that stuff to him. He'd never been back in jail after Tamika had him put there the first time. And why was that? He wasn't compliant with the order. It was because he made partial payments. Look, he already had a tax lien from her. She was already getting any tax refund that he earned. He already had a back child support judgment in excess of $5,000. He couldn't go to Afghanistan and work anyway. And 
as Fuchs kept saying, he asked Tamika to take it off. Did she? No, she didn't take it off. That judgment is still in effect. It's always been in effect. He couldn't have gone to Afghanistan anyways. And his professional license wasn't going to be suspended or terminated because he doesn't have a professional license. He takes a certification at the beginning of each job. So you see, there is literally no reason relative to child support which would have prompted Mr. Segura to commit these horrible acts. It, just, it doesn't make sense. Mr. Hughes wants to say, you know, sometimes you just can't prove that. Sometimes you just don't know. Well, you better know. If you're going to accuse, it's one thing, like, he mentioned uh, Ted Bundy or somebody in opening state. It's one thing if that's the type of case you're talking about. Like, if you're talking about somebody who dresses up like a clown and bears people in their crawl space, okay, then you don't have to know why. But if you're going to talk about a guy who's been a hard worker his entire life, and as you heard when he took the stand, is not a convicted felon, and that's something you'll be able to consider when weighing his credibility, who just all of a sudden commits a purposeful, planned out murder of not only one of his girlfriends, but his child and two other children that called him daddy and whose diapers he changed, you, you better explain that. You better have a rational motive theory that is consistent with the other evidence in the case. And their motive theory simply isn't. I mean, he hadn't even had ch a chance. Yes, there was a dispute about whether Javante was his son, but he hadn't even gotten the result of that dispute yet. He hadn't even had a chance to have the DNA tested yet. And then you compare that to the alternative motives in this case. Mr. Fuchs himself says one of the possible motives is money. You heard testimony, unrebutted testimony, that these guys, Paramore and Griffin, had fronted Brandy drugs. That she had failed to repay those drugs. She failed to pay them back for those drugs. Now, we don't know what happened to the money or the drugs. We know that Kalo and Griffin and those guys had a falling out, and that Kalo and Griffin did business through a, through a third party who he didn't name. Maybe that was Brandy, and maybe Kalo got the drugs. I don't know. But that's probably something that they should have investigated. What we do know is that Dr. De La Cruz told us, and his testimony is unrebutted as well, you have a Zeta calling card at the scene. Does that mean Zetas came to Tallahassee? I don't know. Maybe it was one of these Zetas. Do I think that Paramore and Griffin really themselves carried out this offense? Doesn't matter what I think, but no. And they're Tallahassee drug dealers. You heard testimony about vice work. There's evidence in ex Exhibit 98 about vice work with the American criminal organization. Testimony about Zetas and Mexican cartel middlemen. And testimony about South American supply siders. Dr. De La Cruz told you about the interaction between those type of groups. And although they were local guys, you know Paramore and Griffin weren't small time. They're doing long sentences in the Fed for drug trafficking. Whether you find that to be a reasonable motive or not, that evidence is uncontradicted, unrebutted by anything. Mr. Fuchs can argue against it all at once. There's no evidence that rebuts it. Then we have the DNA. The evidence pertaining to the DNA, not the lack of evidence. There is foreign DNA found under Brandy's fingernails. Like, just stop for a second and feel the weight of that piece of evidence. There is foreign DNA under her fingernails. Like, what would the state be saying if it was Henry's DNA under her fingernails? How compelling of a piece of evidence would they say that is? He, he threw out the theory during cross-examination that maybe it's a nail technician, okay? If you think it's a nail technician, go talk to her sisters and her mom and find out where she gets her nails done, go to the nail salon, get buckle swabs from everybody, and test it. When you're the party with the sole and exclusive burden of proof, you don't have the, the luxury to just toss out theories and ask the jury to accept them. You have to exclude evidence-based doubt, non-speculative, non-imaginary doubt. Evidence of DNA under her fingernails is non-speculative, non-imaginary doubt. And they did nothing, have done nothing, to exclude it. We also have foreign DNA in the bedroom. These points are points, by the way, which tend to support, support the idea that multiple assailants were involved in the commission of the offense. So you have one person's DNA 
under her fingernails. Then you have somebody else's DNA, a male's DNA, on the phone cradle. Now there was a lot of argument about whether it's Avila's DNA or whether it's not. Let's just go to the best case scenario for the state first. The best case scenario for the state is that it's some other guy besides Henry's DNA. And it's not Javante's DNA either. There was a question about that. You can, if you don't have notes or you don't remember, request that the court reporter read back portions of transcript or testimony during your deliberations. If you need to be reminded that Javante and Henry were both excluded from the phone, feel free to ask. Talking specifically about whether the DNA is a Vila's, what you need to remember is the following. Three out of the four experts, including two out of three state experts, said the mixture was at least two people. Not cleanly two people, at least two people. And when it's at least two people, and not cleanly two people, it makes, it makes exclusion a lot more difficult. Which is why Joellen Brown, one of the state's experts, and Kevin Nobinger, the defense expert, both agreed that it was interpretable and that the inclusion could be done with respect to Mr. Avila. These are the foreign allele numbers identified both by Joellen Brown and Kevin Nobinger. Avila is a 12 at DA. The foreign allele identified by Joellen Brown and by Kevin Oppinger, a 12. Avila is an 810 at D7. The foreign allele identified by Joellen Brown and Kevin Oppinger, a 10. At THO, Avila is an 89. The foreign allele at 89 on the evidentiary sample, 89. At D13, Avila is an 1112. The foreign allele present, a 12. At D18, he's a 911. You find an 11. At VWA, he's a 1718. You got your 17. At T Pox, 9 and 11. He's an 11. At D18, he's a 1518. Find the 18. D5, 11, 12. The evidentiary sample has a 12. And at FGA, it's a genotype. Both allele are present, 21, 25. He's a 21, 25. The reason that Mr. Mapplefresh excluded. Mr. Avila from being a possible contributor here is because he identified a 14 in BWA and a 7 at one of the other levels. Joellen Brown, not having any idea in the world, as a state expert, doing blind interpretation, not knowing anybody who anybody is relative to the case, made the reasonable scientific assumption that those allele were probably from the girls, 14 and 7 at those specific looks. And so, she said they weren't foreign allele. And defense expert Noppinger agreed with her. Remember that. Like, I don't know how many cases you guys are aware of, I'm not aware of very many cases, where, the, where the, one of the defense's main expert is the state's DNA expert. There is agreement between Joellen Brown and Kevin Noppinger about what the DNA data is. And what Mr. Noppinger says is, Frequency of occurrence for Latin Americans is 1 in 15,000. You would expect to see that profile only one time in a, in a sample of 15,000 Latin American people, which necessarily means, as he testified, that you would expect 14,999 in a 15,000 person sample to be excluded, eliminated from being involved in that DNA mixture. That's 99.99% of that population sample. Yet Avila is included. The other piece of foreign DNA we have, which corroborates multiple people being involved in the offense, is the shovel. Although the shovel had no blood spatter or blood on it, it did have touch DNA on it. And the touch DNA, <coughs> and the touch DNA on the shovel excluded Henry. It was some foreign male. Not Henry, not Avila. So you have three different foreign donors present in the house. Female, under her fingernails, a male, a vila, on the phone, and another male on the shovel. That's the first group of evidence that tends to show multiple assailants 
were involved in the commission of the offense. And then you have the shoe impression information. The shoe impressions that were found were around Brandy's body. Remember what the state said, what the witnesses said about what the cops were doing. The cops opened the front door and came in to clear the house. That was their purpose in coming in. They also testified that they attempted to avoid stepping in the blood so as to contaminate the scene. If they're going to clear the house, they ain't going to be going that way. You know why they ain't going to be going that way? Because the house doesn't go that way. There's no more rooms over here. Here's the front door. Here's where Brandy is. This is where that couch is. This is where all those steps are. They can see the edge of the house right there. They're not going to clear anything else because there's no other rooms over there. You also have the fact that even this one, see A right there? Even that one, which is in an area where you ex would expect law enforcement to have stepped if they were going around Brandy's body, is obviously facing the wrong way. You can see the directionality of that shoe print. And that's the heel right there, and it's facing that way. Law enforcement said, that's a closer up of it. Law enforcement said that once they came in, they established a different egress. They went out the garage, and yet you have this shoe going out the front door. <clears throat> Again, you can see here that there's no more house over there. There's nothing else that's clear over there. That curtain at the far right side of this picture is the edge of the house. That's the wall, the edge of the house. There's nothing over there to clear. We also have to talk, unfortunately, about the number of weapons used. We know that a gun was used. That's obvious. We know that a long weapon, such as a crowbar or a bat, was used as Mr. Knox testified to. There's blood spatter way up high on the ceiling, and way up high on the walls. It's radiating upward. The unrebutted testimony is that a revolver could not have caused that blood spatter. Mr. Fuchs can argue that's not credible all he wants, but Mr. Knox has done lots and lots and lots of murder investigations, most of them as a cop, and he said he's never seen a gun caused that kind of spatter. The unrebutted evidence is that it had to be some sort of longer weapon that caused that blood spatter. What he also said is that the, 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 one of the weapons, at least, that caused the injuries had to be heavy and round. You see pictures of that as well. The injuries I'll go through quickly here. Evans, as Mr. Knox said, different types of weapons being used. You have curved injuries. You have injuries which perforate. You have pointed injuries. You have, again, perforating injuries on the back of her head. And this is the picture of the round injury, which was right on top of the crown of her forehead, which he said could not have been caused by a crowbar. It would have had to be caused by something heavier and round, and you can see the round impression there. Again, on the front of her head right there, you can see where she was dented by something like a bat or a hammer or something like that. That's the same injury there. The wound to her face, Mr. Fuchs showed you a picture of during his case, uh, during his closing, was caved in. Again, Mr. Knox said that would have had to be caused by something with significant weight in order to deliver the type of force necessary to cause that injury. Another piece of evidence which indicates um, multiple people involved in the offense is the sequence of events related to the injuries that she's received. And so, remember that only four shots were fired before Brandy makes it out of the house the first time. We see a shot that goes out the window, we see two shots that go into the bathroom, and we see one shot that lands in the hall closet. That's only four. All those injuries that she's sustained are happening at the same time. So once she's brought back inside, she's shot six or seven more times while she's being beat. And in the process of committing those shootings, the shooter has to stop and reload because there's only six or seven shots to a revolver. And how does he or she do that without spilling shell casings all over the floor unless other people are taking care of her? Because you don't find shell casings. What you find is that the shooter had time to empty all the shell casings out of the revolver, put more bullets back in the revolver, 
and continue shooting. We also have to talk about Tamaya's murder. Mr. Knox told you that Stippling was present, meaning the gun had to be within a few feet of her when she was shot. But there was no soot present, meaning it had to be at least six inches away from her. There is no saturation from Tamaya's blood on the couch or on the floor. And there are blood swipes going into the bathroom where she was found. We know that she was the last of the children killed because she's the one on top in the tub. Who was taking care of the other two kids while this struggle with Brandy is going on? Because why would Tanaya be shot in the living room unless it is for the purpose of doing it in front of Brandy? There are other exits from the house. There are windows. There are other doors. Why would it be that she's coming from the living room and being put in the tub? Unless they killed her in front of Brandy while Brandy is still alive. The fact that that happened, the fact that they killed her in front of Brandy while Brandy is still alive, indicates that someone else must have been dealing with the other kids during the course of this struggle. And that's just common sense. But how is one person physically, possibly, going to wrangle all of these people? All these children, and I mean, the twins are not infants. They certainly know how to get out of the house if they see all this going on. And if it happens first, why would Denia have been shot in the living room? It doesn't make sense, and it's not physically possible. That evidence is another reasonable doubt based on the evidence presented in this case. And so I think it, it bears mentioning at least what the defense theory on how, on how this went down is. Because ultimately what you have to answer is, does the state's evidence exclude such a theory? What we know from the testimony introduced, from Henry, from some of the letters, is that Brandy is, is rumored to, to have a son with Caleb, that Javante is supposed to be his son. Griffin tells us, although begrudgingly, that he was in business, in the drug business, with Caleb. They were doing business through a third party, as I mentioned before. That Brandy had received drugs from Griffin and Paramore for distribution that she doesn't pay back, and that sometime after that, Caleb and Griffin have a falling out. Is it unreasonable at all to suggest that Paramore and Griffin, who didn't get paid for the drugs, notified their suppliers? And we know, again, about the relationship between street-level dealers, American criminal organizations, Mexican cartels, and South American suppliers from Dr. Dela Cruz. And then we have evidence at the scene which would tend to indicate that there is Zeta or wannabe Zeta involvement in the commission of the offense, including the calling card, the spade. But again, there's been no evidence introduced to contradict that point. So what can we surmise happened? Based on the witness testimony, we can surmise that a group shows up in white suburban between 10.30 and 11 p.m. Dr. Dela Cruz said that often cartels will send a female to the front door to get access. That happened in this case. When Brandy saw the other guys coming, she would have run from the front door down the hall to the bedroom where the phone is located at. When she gets to the bedroom where her phone is located at, there's a struggle. You see the scuff mark on the wall? We know that the phone jack is pulled out of the wall. And then after that, the phone cut is cord, and the phone cord is cut. Then the shooting starts. The first bullet goes out her window. The second bullet goes through the wall and lands in the closet. The next two bullets go into the bathroom and are located right next to each other. That's Brandy's bathroom, the bathroom attached to her bedroom. After that, we see a directional blood, blood swipe where Brandy is running back out into the hallway. Once she's in the hallway, she engages in struggle. You have a knocked over lamp, you have blood spatter on both sides of the wall, and you have female DNA under her fingernail. So perhaps at this point she's re-engaged in struggle with the female. Her bracelet falls off, again it wasn't tested for DNA, but we know she made it out of the house. There's a directional swipe on the door, and that's Brandy Peter's blood. Once she's outside, we have impact spatter showing that she was struck outside. And after she makes it past that point, it takes a few more steps, you have spatter going in both directions, indicating reasonably that she's being struck from both directions. 
perhaps somebody else was waiting in the front yard for her, a lookout or another person involved in the offense. We know what happened to her and the kids after she was taken back inside. We don't need to go over that again. The other thing that we have to consider here is Mr. Segura's own testimony. As Mr. Fuchs pointed out, one of the things that the judge instructs you when evaluating the credibility of witness testimony is whether that testimony is consistent with the other testimony and evidence introduced in the case. And before we talk about the, the, the consistencies between Mr. Segura's testimony and the other evidence and testimony in the case, it does bear addressing the inconsistencies, the lies. Right? That, that is why he is here, because he held fastly to his lies about whether he had any relationship with Brandy and whether he was over at her house on the day of the murder. It's important to note that the only topic about which he lies is his relationships with other women. That's the only thing he lies consistently about. In one of the interview clips you heard, it was one of the defense clips, Investigator Lewis actually says to him, you can sense it. He's like, look, we're not the moral police, we're just the police. If, it's, if there's something going on, just tell us. But Henry won't do it. Nope, nothing going on, that's not it. And look at the text, Mr. Fuchs talked about the text messages that were deleted. They're all deleted, first of all, including exculpatory text. The text that, again, Mr. Fuchs has not mentioned. The victim said, Mr. Segura, a text on Thursday, after she had sent those negative texts, those nasty texts on Tuesday, she te sends him a text on Thursday, after both sides agree he went over to her house. He says he talked to her, he chilled her out, and let her know, look, I got shot, I'll be back on soon, I'll be making money again soon, I'll get you some money. Then she sends him a text saying, you was looking good. If you wasn't my baby daddy, I would have gave you some. Wow. LOL. Queen B. Immediately after that, you see them start calling and communicating. How inconsistent is that with their theory about what his state of mind is? Like they're trying to convince you there's this big confrontation brewing that Rainey's trying to have him put in jail. Does that sound like that? Or does it sound like we're good? We're ready to hook up again. It also bears mentioning that he keeps not talking about that. They didn't introduce it there during their testimony, and he hasn't mentioned it during his closing. That's part of the evidence in this case. And when you're the party with the burden of proof, you can't just run away from the bad facts you don't like. You have to exclude doubts raised from those bad facts with actual evidence. They don't have any evidence that deals with that fact. Talks about a cover-up. Talks about the fact that he didn't tell them about his phone that he got rid of the phone. He did both of those things. Why is that? We know why that is. All of his calls and all of his texts are in evidence. You can look at them if you want to. The reason he's deleting texts and the reason he doesn't give them the phone and the reason he doesn't he gets rid of the phone is because it contains all the evidence in the world about him cheating on his wife. You see all those texts in there. Some of them to Natasha Hawthorne, some of them to other women, and that's what he has consistently told you he is trying to protect. The only text that he deletes that has nothing to do with that is the one about getting rid of the Monte Carlo. Don't you think if that were not true, don't you think if that were not true, that the Monte Carlo was not stolen, the state would have come running back in here in rebuttal to say, nope, we ran them in, it, it's, it's not stolen, you're lying, you wanted to get rid of it because it had some evidence of this case. By the way, they did a search warrant on the Monte Carlo. They processed it. And there was no physical evidence tying Monte Carlo to the scene. So why else would he want to get rid of it unless it's stolen? Having addressed and discussed some of the issues that the state has raised about his credibility, let's talk about the evidence that does support what Mr. Segura says. Whether his testimony is consistent with the phone records. You saw from the phone records that Mr. Segura at least forwarded, if not received, on Tuesday, 11-16, leading text messages from Brandy. We already talked about that. She's threatening to put him in jail. Everybody agrees. The phone record shows he went over to her house on 11-17, which was Wednesday. He testified what happened when he was over there. He told her what his situation was and calmed her down. She sends the text that we just talked about the next day, Thursday, at 9.58 a.m. 
Immediately after that text, immediately after that text, Henry calls her. They talk for half an hour. What does that look like? Does that look like an argument? Hey, you was looking good. I would have gave you some. And they call and talk for half an hour. Does that look like an argument to you or no? The next day, Friday, the 19th, Henry says they plan to meet up. You see that he calls her at 11.30 a.m. Phone records are in evidence, and you can look at all that yourself. They talked for 55 minutes at that point. Again, does that look like an argument? I mean, what would there be to say if they were arguing? What would there be to say? There'd be nothing to say. Give me my child support. I'll get you your child support when you can. All right? We still have 54 minutes and 45 seconds. What else are we going to talk about? It just doesn't make sense. It's not the most likely explanation or interpretation of the evidence. We see that Henry's still home at 12.36 and told Brandy during that 55-minute conversation that he would come over to her house later that afternoon. By 1.15, 1.20, Henry's phone is showing up in a location consistent with Brandy's house. There are calls at 1.19, 1.23, and 1.24. He doesn't get a hold of her with those calls. He explained that he had arrived at her house. He was trying to get a hold of her to see if she was ready. 1.26, he does get a hold of her, and he said she was with her mom and that they would have to meet up later. And so, he says that he goes to his sister's house. And there are seven calls between 1.41 and 3 o'clock consistent with him being at his sister's house. They're all over in sector one, all within the air range that Mr. Sawicki showed you. All at his sister's house. That's how you know when you look at the phone records. I think it was Investigator Corbett who said it. Mr. Sawicki certainly agrees. The, the best indicator of when Mr. Segura is at Brandy's house as opposed to at his sister's house is when he's jumping the sector line, sector one to sector two, because Brandy's house is right by the sector line. You're not doing that if you're over at Sean's house, because Sean's house is right in the middle of sector one. And so from 141 to three, Mr. Segura is at a location consistent with Sean's house. And he talks to Brandy while he's at Sean's house. At 2.13, they have a phone call. That's when Henry says, Brandy tells him that she's gonna pick the kids up at 2.45 and he should come over after that, that call gets cut off though. We know that because Brandy sends him a text after that saying, what happened? Did you hang up? Not, hey, why'd you hang up or whatever they said when they were trying to introduce the text. They didn't read you the whole text. They had to come back on cross-examination and ask Mr. Corbett, Mr. Peter Corbett, about what the text actually said. They got cut off, but Henry got all the information that he needed. He did, the phone record show, he did attempt to call her back at 227, but she didn't answer that call. And then at about 310, we see Henry going back over towards Brandy's house. He said he went over to the church parking lot and walked to her house, and that's what the phone records show. He starts jumping the sector line again at that point. Henry said that he waited for Brandy's mom to leave. He saw her leave right around 5 o'clock, and that's when he walked to her house, and then on the way to her house before they hooked up, he called his son to see if he was home. Rather, called his house to see if his son was home. We see that call in his records. That call is consistent with what he says happened. And then we see, Henry said he gets to her house, walks inside, they basically hook up right away. We see periods of inactivity on both of their phones during that period. Brandy's phone is inactive from 451 to 523. Henry's phone is inactive from 5 o'clock to 545. That is consistent with what Henry says. We then know that, Han that Brandy got back on the phone and started talking to her mom at 551 p.m. And except for a one minute break in when somebody called the, her phone and she accepted another call during that call. She was essentially on the phone with her mom from uh, 5.51 to 6.52 p.m. Henry told us that during that time period he was sitting on the couch, he's playing with Javante, he's watching TV, and he's texting. And his records show that and, and prove that as well. At 5.45, 6.01, 6.05, 6.07, 6.10, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40
the kids, Randy and Henry, hang out watching TV together from 7.30 or thereabouts until the time Henry leaves shortly after 8 o'clock. Randy's phone is inactive during that time, but Henry's phone is not inactive during that time. Henry's phone is texting and receiving data transmissions at 7.23, 7.23, and 7.37. So, if you think he's killing her during that time, notwithstanding the affirmative proof that she was still alive till 10.30, he's also texting while he's doing it. We then have Henry gone by 8.21 according to his phone records. He's, the, the location of his handset is consistent with him driving back down Paul Russell, which is on the way to Woodville Highway, which is how he gets home. I, I also think it's worth mentioning and want to make sure that you notice, with respect to Brandy's records, that the state asked Investigator Corbett about where the last tenth transmission, text, or call Brandy's phone was at, whether it was at a location consistent with her home or whether it was moving away from her home. And they tried to suggest at that point that it was moving away from her home by, by saying it was farther north than the other readings. But then during the defense case in chief, we had to go back and address that with Mr. Sawicki, and he told you the distance from tower data for Brandy's phone was totally consistent with what it had been from 5 o'clock to the time that it went off, specifically. And these, these records are in evidence. You can look at them yourself. The distance from tower readings from 553, when she got on the phone with her mom, until 749, when her phone goes off the record, uh, off the network, are 1.02 miles at 553, 1.0650, yeah, 553, 1.06 mi uh, miles at 653, 1.06 miles at 611, 1.44 miles at 612, 1.29 miles at 653, 1.70 miles at 657, 1.52 miles at 656, 1.17 miles at 714, 1.7 mile, 1.17 miles at 726, and 1.14 miles at 749 p.m. It's exactly the same. There's variance, but it's all within the same variance. There's nothing at all that indicates her phone is on the move. And so, why would I submit that they tried to make it sound like her phone was on the move? Because at that time, they still were asserting that Jack McClain Jack Park was related to this offense. I would submit that they had to change theory midstream because they found out Investigator Lewis didn't know the stuff was te wasn't tested. I'm going to check. This is not, this is not a question I've asked. What Investigator Lewis said during his testimony was that in 2016, when he was deposed, he didn't know that there was DNA, comparable testable DNA, found at the scene. What Investigator Lewis said when he was on the stand testifying is that he had believed, as late as 2016, the scene was wiped down and cleaned up. Is it also implausible that he didn't know the stuff wasn't tested? I mean, why else? Again, why else would the state have been introducing all that evidence from Jack McClain Park and walking it back and forth in front of you if they didn't think it was relevant to the case? That's the reason for the cell phone question. The last thing that I want to talk about is a glimpse of Henry that you can get from the evidence in the record. I told you in open. I would not ask you to step over three children on the way to a not guilty verdict. Step over Brandy on the way to a not guilty verdict without showing you or trying to show you a little bit of who Henry is. You can gather things about who he is by looking at information in the evidence. For example, he talked to the cops initially. He didn't hide from them. He cooperated with them. The first time he went in there, not knowing what the DNA evidence of the scene was yet, he gave them a buckle swab. When they wanted to see whether he had injuries on him, he took his shirt off and let them take pictures. When they asked him to come back in for a second interview, he came back in for a second interview and stayed there and talked to him. In this case, he took the stand and submitted himself to cross-examination by a professional cross-examiner and told you his side of the story. And in so doing, opened himself up to exposing bad stuff about himself that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to know. The state's not allowed to put on bad character evidence. They wouldn't have been allowed to tell you that he was involved in a shootout in some other state. I'm not scared of the bad stuff about Henry. He does bad stuff. He also does good stuff. He has good in it. Like we talked about at the beginning of this closing, the people who did this offense have no good in them. They are evil to their core. 
This is a text message that is part of the records that are in evidence. This is a text message between Henry and his little girl. Good night, Daddy. I love you. I love you too, my little princess. Six exclamation points and four happy faces. What does that prove? It doesn't prove anything. But it's a glimpse. It's a glimpse to who he is. They can talk all they want about, well, he knows this is his daughter. He didn't know Javante's son. So what? This cannot coexist with somebody who looks into the face of a baby boy and holds him underwater until life leaves his body. Those two things can't live in the same person. So while he does bad, he also is good. While he cheats on his wife, he is a hard worker. While he, while he lies, he is a good dad. He's a street guy. He does street stuff. He receives stolen property, stolen cars. He's not perfect. But he's not the devil either. That's why I'm not afraid to show you Henry. That's why I promised I would show you Henry, despite having no burden whatsoever to prove or disprove anything. And so in finishing up, let me just remind you what the question is we're here to answer. It's not a puzzle. It's not an investigation. It is an analysis of evidence presented by the state. Mr. Fuchs can get back up here and argue any point he wants. He can point to any evidence that is inconsistent with anything I've said. At the end of the day, he has a theory. His theory is consistent with some evidence. His theory is inconsistent with evidence. He may be able to point to pieces of evidence which undermine or tend to impact the credibility of the evidence and the theories submitted by the defense. But none of that is really an issue. The only issue is whether their evidence excludes and eliminates all of the reasonable doubts about the DNA under her fingernails, about the time of death, about multiple assailants being involved in the commission of the offense. Have they introduced anything which prevents the truth of those evidence-based doubts? I would submit that reasonable people cannot disagree about that. But that doesn't mean that there won't be disagreement in the jury room. This is a horrible case. Everybody here wants justice. Everybody here wants someone to pay. But the reason that the standard of evidence is so high is because what if? That's a thought that's going to be in your head. I know you'll all follow the law, but that's a thought that's going to be in your head. What if we're wrong? What if he did this? Yeah, well, the reason that the standard is so high is because what if he didn't do it and you refused to follow the law? Judge Hankinson told you any verdict which doesn't scrupulously follow the instructions he's given is a miscarriage of justice. And that could not be more true than in a capital murder prosecution where a father is being prosecuted for killing one of his own sons, where he's being prosecuted for killing two little girls that called him daddy and whose diapers he had changed. If as you sit there now, you still think the possibility exists that Henry Segura beat Randy Peters to death. It's not because the possibility does exist. It's because I've failed to show you enough of who he is. If you think the possibility exists that he held Javante underwater until life left his body, it's not because the possibility exists. It's because I failed to show you enough of who he is. If you still think it, you sit here now. He shot and drowned those two little girls who called him daddy and whose diapers he changed while at the same time communicating with his own little girl, his own little princess. It is not because that possibility exists, but because I failed to show you enough of who he is. I have carried the burden of an innocent man's life as far as I can carry it. Don't shrink from that burden. Don't look at him as a defendant. Recognize the law. Recognize the value of his life. Follow the law as instructed by the judge. And if you do, you know what the verdict will be, and you know how fast it will come. Nothing further.